So, uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there's 41 of you in the class, in the session at the moment, uh, besides myself and our speaker. So, uh, very good afternoon. Assalamualaikum. Uh, salam sejahtera to all who managed to come. Uh, today's class is online uh, via WebEx. So, um, I want to welcome, uh, first of all, our speaker uh, into the class uh, today, uh, Kersin. Uh, Kersin will be um, giving her talk in a while. Uh, but before Kersin uh, starts uh, her session, uh, Kersin, give me some time so I can do some briefing first uh, to, to everyone. So, okay, uh, as you guys know, today marks the start of our five week uh, study session. Uh, so, what is this study session all about? Basically, I bring my friends slash students. Um, the next two sessions, session number two and session number three, uh, are my students actually. Um, and then the rest are friends. So basically what they have to do is they come to class, they share the experience. Uh, there's a scope that, that is given to them to share. And then uh, this is where you can relate what's happening uh, in our actual syllabus, which what with what, what's actually happening um, in terms of out there, uh, the real life situation. So the whole purpose of doing this is to get you guys to uh, to match. Okay, is out are the theories that we learned uh, applicable or suitable uh, in practice outside? Uh, so with that, uh, let me quickly uh, share my screen first in terms of uh, things that I need to update everyone. Okay. Uh, this is your e-learning page. I think most of you are familiar with this. Uh, Kersin uh, is slightly upgraded page of e-learning, but um, this uh, is same functions uh, from last time. Uh, so I want you guys to go down to... Okay, weeks 19 to 14, study section with externals. Weeks 19 to 14, a study session with externals. Uh, this morning, I added another slide into uh, the, uh, the system. Let me stop sharing and toggle to the other slide a bit so that you can have a look. Uh, I will put the slides into the uh, chat function. So you can directly. Uh, alternatively, you can go to e-learning to, uh, to check the file out. Now you should be able to see a Google slide page. Uh, to download this slide, uh, click file, go to download, and you can choose what kind of uh, format that you want to download. Uh, I recommend either PowerPoint or PDF. Um, this file is the master file for all the theories that we're going to learn for the next five weeks. Uh, the speaker won't be talking about it. The speakers won't be talking about it, of course, but I want you guys to have a look at what, ki what kind of concepts on theories that we will be covering. So, um, a quick update. Uh, every session that we have is actually designed based on a particular set of theory or a particular set of uh, concepts. So, today is session one. Psychosocial development approaches in student development. Um, study session two and three, where my students will come in, uh, they will talk about cognitive structural uh, approaches and uh, the wellness model. Uh, the wellness model is actually um, a con very important content that is covered in one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Uh, session four, uh, global citizenship, uh, very important uh, in the context of for example, in our class today, uh, we have both domestic students, domestic, domestic means for Malaysia, and international students. Uh, why is it important for us to understand what is the global citizenship uh, concept? And finally, the final session, uh, social identity theory and person environment uh, interactive theories. So um, essentially what you have to do after every session is to write out a, a reflection. Uh, it's 10 marks per reflection. Uh, check the deadline for submission. Uh, it's inside the file. 
So essentially a guide for you to track your timeline. Um, one week after the session, that's the deadline. Uh, but the hard deadline, as I mentioned at the start of the class, is the final week of week 15. Uh, final week of week 15 is the last class of the semester. So uh, make sure you submit everything by that week. Um, wait for your uh, stuff to be marked by me. All right. So reflection questions. Um, there is a set of guide guidelines. Uh, also go back to e-learning as I mentioned from last week. Um, for the guidelines, uh, essentially this is the uh guiding questions. What are the three learning points that you will go through uh throughout the session? Uh, how do you relate? Why do you relate to the points? Uh, what are the important components to manage in student development? And finally, what can you do with the learning points obtained? So um, essentially, guys, uh, what is what should be done is uh, attend class, go through the uh, Google slide presentation just now. Um, every week, there is, there is a set of theories that you need to handle. For example, uh, this week, uh, we are going to handle psychosocial development approaches. So there is a set of theories uh, presented. And then at the end of the session, um, prepare your reflection. And this reflection, uh, 10 marks per reflection, uh, based on a set of items. If you want to have a look at how do I grade the marks, later, um, go back to your e-learning page. Let me share the page uh with you guys okay this is on your e-learning let me click back and see uh remind everyone where is the item located the item is located at weeks 9 to 14 study session with externals reflection guideline click on it scroll down and this is how your items will be graded. Essentially, uh, there are five, uh, two scales, uh, depth of reflection and textual evidence. Um, format, I do not need a long content, one page, A4 in English, convert into PDF before uploading. All right, so um, any questions, guys? We haven't started doing it, so there might be questions later. So uh, you can still ask. Um, anyway, that's my part of the briefing. Um, we will head straight into the next session, uh, which is the study session. Uh, Kasin, the session is yours. Um, some story about how Kasin and I met. Uh, Kasin was a student from UTM before. Uh, mm. I think you can <laughs> introduce yourself uh, a bit uh, better later. Uh, we met through student uh, organization, um, conducting activities for students relating to global citizenship, uh, something that another friend will cover later on in the weeks. Um, and uh, after Kasin left uh, UTM, she uh, pursued um, a study in a completely different field. Uh, and you ended up working on the field that you're you're pursuing for masters. So I think uh, the students might be interested to 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 know uh, what's your background like, um, how do you enter your current field, um, mm -hmm. and uh, some interesting items that you want to share with your with your uh, your with our students today. So um, with that, Kasin, the floor is yours. Uh, Enjoy yourself. Uh, but guys, if you have any questions at all, uh, you jot down your questions. Um, there are two ways of doing it. Either uh, type in the chat function or you switch on right later, ask directly. Uh, mm -hmm. So those are the two ways that you can ask your questions. Uh, don't worry about whether you can capture um, the session content or not, because the recording I will share with everyone after uh, Webex has generated the recording. So, uh, Kasin, officially, is yours. Thank you so much for coming uh, into my class today.
Thank you. Thank you, Dora, for inviting me. I'm actually quite shocked when she asked me to give a sharing session. It's been a while since the last time I did my sharing, honestly. <laughs> so I was a bit nervous. Okay. Anyway, uh, nice to have you all here. I see some faces here and, and thank you for, for having the video so that I, I know I have some audience in front of me. Okay. So uh, I'm Kersin. You can just call me Kersin. Oh, thank you for the claps. That's very nice. Okay, so um, Dora, can I have a slide first? Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm muted. Okay. Uh, Ganyin, I see you raising your hand. Is it accidental uh, or oh. you have a question you want to ask? Sorry, it's wrong. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. She, Nana, also raised hand. Are you having issue with your? You want to have a? You want to ask question? Nana? Okay. Uh, keep your questions. Uh, so, uh, Kirsten, the floor is yours. Just let me know mm. uh, when to click. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, um, before I start, uh, just, just let me know if I talk too fast or talk too slow that you don't really understand. You just let me know. So, you can just raise your hands or you can just put in the chat box, right? So, um, there will be time that I, I would, would love to have some responses or, or questions from you all or feedback from you all, okay? So I'm Kersin, I'm a school counsellor with three KL International School. So I'm based in KL right now in Subang Jaya. So this is my full-time job, but actually I do have um, engaged with some other centres doing private practice. So I do see adults and my major job, which is based in school, which, which means that I actually see a lot of secondary students um, in my school, which is from year, we call year seven to year 11, around 13 to 17 or 18 years old in my school. Okay, so next. Thank you. So Dora said um, to introduce ourselves a little bit. Yeah, so I thought maybe just a bit of um, things about me and probably work you can find some reason why I actually switch my job later on. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I am a Johorian, so I actually studied in UTN with Joria, um many years back. So I'm actually from Johor as well, but currently I'm working in KL. I love to travel a lot, so that was one of the reasons why I joined the society with Doria the other day, I mean last time. Uh, because I really love to have internship overseas. So I did my internship in Czech Republic last time and did my traveling a lot in Europe. Um, I'm an art lover. I love whichever art form. It can be photography, music, um, paintings, etc. etc. I'm an explorer. I really love to explore new things. That's why you can see the photo. I, I love to explore different, different activities. Um, I think I enjoy having some, uh, something to moving forward. Yeah, some motivation in life. That's why I'm like, keep trying new things, experience new things. Uh, and next is some um, quite determined. You can call me determined person, or you can call me stubborn person too. <laughs> There's a thin line in between. Uh, I can be quite determined in the things I want to do. Uh, later on, you will find out more. But you can call me stubborn person too. Um, I, I kind of like stick to what I really want and can be quite hard-headed towards that too, <laughs> sometimes. Patient and impatient. Uh, I'm, I would say I'm quite patient with all my students most of the time, Yeah, if they don't get make me angry. But uh, most of the time I'm pretty patient with them no matter what they say and um, what in what kind of situations. Oh, I can be impatient in outside of counseling sessions. <laughs> it depends on situation. Yeah, like especially when I'm driving. Yeah, a bit more impatient. Uh, I self claim myself as ambivert between introvert and extrovert. I think there are times I prefer to enjoy my own time, like alone, alone. Uh, there are times I like to hang out with friends, um, go travel, or just. Makan, makan, I mean, eating together, like dinner together. Yeah, these are what I like. So I think I'm quite balanced in a sense. And last but not least, uh, and 
just like Doria said, something changed me and I pursued in another uh, master's degree, right? So maybe this is the core in me, uh, which I believe in humanity. So I, I think um, this core in me kind of drive, drive, um, drove me to the other direction of my career path after I graduated from UTM. Yeah, so I'll share a bit more later, maybe the next one. Okay, so far you can catch me, right? If I don't say certain, certain things clearly, you can just give me a signal so I can stop and explain. Okay, so a little bit of experience of mine. Uh, I graduated uh, around 2010, I think 2010, yes. So I was studying biology at the time, pure biology. Um, I think is the faculty of uh, education still the same building? Doria? Uh, faculty of science still around. Uh, faculty of uh, faculty of education becomes school of education. Oh. And the faculty of social science and humanities. Oh, so, wow. uh, yeah, social science and humanities cover uh school of education, language academy, uh Islamic studies, uh wow. human resource and uh sharps, uh human resource and psychology, uh and then uh KL. There's another faculty, uh, social sciences in KL. Mm, wow. So it has expanded to that extent. Wow. Yes. Yeah, because we used to be very close, like faculty of science. And I remember we, we kind of, maybe we bump into in the library quite often. Yep. Yes. <laughs> very close to the, the library. Yeah. Yep. So I, I was a biology student last time and then I graduated because I don't really like work with um, DNA and RNA and uh, chromosomes and <laughs> all those things. So all the virus, bacteria, those things that I cannot see, I, I really cannot stand. So I decided to become something very different, which is a HR development person. So I became a trainer. Imagine after I graduated, the first job I have, right, is actually a trainer. I, I even, I myself quite shocked. Uh, quite thankful the, the, my previous manager actually has the faith in me. So she, she said, I can try to become a trainer and see how it goes. So I was in training line, the conducting training for corporates, for uh, staffs, for example, soft skill training. Um, I did some very technical training, like um, I was used to be with FedEx before. So I trained a lot of couriers in how they use their, with the last time we called it power pad, the, the one that you sign when you receive your package. Yeah, there's like a technical way of using that. So last time I did a lot of technical training, um, soft skill training, um, yeah, management training and things like that. So I was in a training life for many years until um, there's a pause in me. You see the yellow color circle where I thought about what I want to do, what I really want to do in life. Is it, is it the setting like now? Like, one to a lot of people is it what i really want so i kind of pause and think about yeah maybe i prefer one-on-one -on -one. i prefer a very personal touch with the person in front of me so that kind of switched my mind and thought about why not i try something different yeah and the core in me which is the belief in humanity i thought i, I want to contribute more and more so that's why i go into this the current industry, which is the psychology industry. So I, I signed up my master's in counseling course with help in USD in KL. So I did my part-time, um, part-time study. So I did like three years, including my internship. So eventually I got my uh, license with the Lumbaga Counselor Malaysia. So I became a registered counselor in 2020 until now. So, and I also pursue in grad cert family therapy with what I believe um, the impact of family in the kids. Yeah, I think it also part of my, my grow up um, experiences because I think I, because Dora mentioned about the psychosocial development just now, right? In the, in your theory, that's what we're supposed to cover. Actually, I think I, I was a bit confused in my own identity when I was in high school. I was not in a good terms with my parents and 
I was striving and trying to find out what happened in my family and myself and a bit confused. But I think eventually I did manage to overcome that. I found my identity. So that was the reason why I thought I'm quite attached to teenagers. I really love to be with them. I, I hope I can contribute a lot with them. I think that that's the reason why I was in family therapy that much. And then I also in uh, EFT, which is the emotional focus therapy, which is another school of thoughts. Yeah. So that's my journey from a biology student to a HR person <laughs> to a registered counselor. It's quite dramatic, right? <laughs> Within, I don't know, like 10 ish years. Yeah. So far, is there any, anything that you want to talk about in any questions? If no, then yeah, we can go next. I hope I'm not doing too fast or too slow. Okay. Yep. So um, a little bit of day to day of my life as a current uh, school counselor. Just a question, a quick question. Maybe you can put in your chat box, right? What do you think that in your in your impression, what do you think the school counselor should school counselor should be doing? Can you put your feedback in your chat box? So you probably heard about school counselor. Maybe you can imagine your school counselors back in your high school. What was it like? What was your impression? Regen said, communicate with others. Give advice to students when they have issues. Yeah. Help students. Yes. Anything else? Oh, enrollment. Course guidance. Yep. Solve students' problem. Mm. Introverted children has a place to talk. Okay. Any other idea? Assist students to be better. Okay. A bridge between students and teachers. Okay. I think I think generally I see the comments are more about helping the students to give them a place, right? A space. Yeah, safety. Yes, yes. Organizing student activities. Yes. Organize activities, safety, soft problems, career planning. Oh, yeah. Basically, you all bingo with most of the things, except the one thing is which I'm not doing. Um, enrollment. Enrollment is part of uh, we call admin's job, which we have an admin department where they will handle all the recruitments and enrollment uh, procedures. Yeah, it's not under counselor's job. Okay, so uh, basically, if you look at the pictures here, the main main thing that I'm doing, yes, is counseling. So I give space to the students to talk to students every single day. Imagine how many students I can meet a day. Maybe you can have a guess. I, I work from around eight to four o'clock in the afternoon. How many students do you think that I can meet a day? You can just pop up any random number. Five to ten students, wow. Three to five, eight. Maybe twenty. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> twenty. I'm I'm probably not here. I'm probably in you know, I, I need I need to see counselor myself then. <laughs> Well, 20 is a lot. Okay, more than 100 students. Wait, 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 do you get my answer? My question, and my question is, how many students I see in a day, okay? One day, one day, <laughs> not one month. 100 students, probably. 100 uh, students. Uh, the answer is quite valid also, because if you see the total students that you meet come into class, come out of class, then 100 lah. But then probably uh, the question is how many students that I have to meet one by one? Ah, yes, 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 you're <laughs> right. Okay, okay. Now I understand why the, the, the answers are so 
yeah, such a big range. Diverged, okay. yeah. Diverged, yes, yes, yes. Okay, mm. okay. Right, so for counselling, um, the maximum students I can meet for counselling, and when I say counselling sessions, means one session takes at least, at least yeah, 30 minutes to one and a half hours, depending on the cases. So I see them, the most I can see for one day of work is the maximum yeah, is six or seven. That's the maximum I can. Yeah, more than that, I, I cannot handle anymore. I, I, need, I need time myself too, because it's very burdening, it's very heavy. Yeah, so um, in the normal setup, if you go to the private setting, uh, like if you go to um, private center, probably they can also the maximum is also like maximum like six or seven too about the same actually because um due to the work nature itself we we absorb a lot of kind of like a negativity or a lot of problems from people right so there's that much of uh, a space that we can take in we can't take more than that and then um, if you look at this, right, the administration one, right, is there's a lock and every single session I need to write report, which means every, let's say I meet that students for 20 times, I need to have 20 reports written. So imagine uh, one report probably costs, like, takes me, maybe the quickest can be like 20 minutes, but the longest, right, like, let's say I have really, I really need a lot, a lot of anal analysis. I probably I probably need like one hour to write one report. So imagine the the kind of workload um from counseling itself already taken uh, in my role. So that is just counseling and that's just um administrative work, right? Um and just now you all mentioned also some organize some activities. Yes. So because we are part of the school team, right? Part of the school uh, teachers uh, team. So we do organize school events as well, such as um, from the picture, you can see there's a cross country run. So we, all, uh, we have this five kilometer run um, organized for all the students in the park. We organize sports day, teachers day, um, career fair, all kinds of events that will involve school counselor as well. Of course, I'm not the main person, but they will, take me, they will ask me to contribute as well, <laughs> whichever I can. Right. And then we also have clubs, you know, co curriculum in, in the school. So we also run peer support group. Imagine or we also so one of the day to day activity I need to do is also to run the club. So I need to guide the students how to run the club and then uh, what kind of activities we can have for this peer support group on every Wednesday on our Coco day. So that's part of the job um, I'm in. And one of one another big part is also the talks. When I say talks, it's not just about mental health. Uh, I think a few of you mentioned about career guidance. Yes, we do career guidance. So student counselor, some schools they divide career counselor and student counselor, they divide it into two different person. But in our school it's the mix. So like which means every single day one one leg kick we need to do everything so career also parked under us so i have another colleague who has just joined me um end of last year i'm so grateful <laughs> so i'm still surviving and talking to you because i have this friend okay <laughs> who's with me so uh yeah so he helped out with a lot of talks mental health um, like cyber bullying we run mental health talks in general we run what else let me think um emotion regulation uh, what else let me think i think a lot of um, career events such as scholarships we help the students to find out what kind of scholarship they can get or what kind of universities uh, professors talk so that there are many types of uh, re career related as well other than mental health and not to forget i have a lot of meetings to attend and one of the most stressful one, what do you think? Let me, I, I let you choose. Parents, meeting with parents, meeting with teachers, meeting with uh, career agencies. Career agencies means those uh, universities, um, including UTM, yes. <laughs> we just get contacted by UTM um, professor in KL, yeah, to run some programs. Um, yeah, or principal. 
or CEO in the team? Which one do you think more stressful? Parents, teachers, uh, meeting with the career agencies, or principal or CEO of the school? Which one do you think more more stressful for me? <laughs> Imagine you were in my shoes. Hmm. Parents. Oh, thank you for being so understanding. Hmm. Dora, you got very very understanding, empathetic students here. <laughs> you can understand my situation so well. So parents nowadays, especially I'm currently in an international school, so imagine the expectations could be quite quite a lot. Yeah. So dealing with parents, um, some of the difficulties, I think it could be relevant to you in your future. Yeah. Uh, for example, dealing with students who probably uh, we suspect they may have some learning issue for example um, adhd or um, autistic students um, in secondary school yeah so it's not easy to talk to them you know parents probably still in denial so or not not like denial i mean it's very difficult news to break to them like oh i suspect your kid maybe have some problem with um, autism. I, I would advise or ref, I would suggest you to, ref, um, to to see a psychologist outside of school. So this is really a hard news to break to them. Yeah, so there were a lot of angry parents who will come back to us and say, why do you say such thing to my kid? Why do you uh, um, why do you take this kind of action? So even they refuse the students to come for a counseling session. They said, my, my kid can never go to counselling because I don't allow school to do so. Yeah, to that extent. So imagine, um, uh, this is one type of parents and there are another type of parents who are quite neglectful. I would say neglectful of their kids. So it's very hard to find them. You cannot find them. You text them, you call them many times. They just say they are busy with work. Yeah, despite their kids actually having a lot of issues in school. So it's not easy to deal with parents and to balance between our balance how be, between our our job and also to consider parents' perspective. Yeah. That that is the hardest one. Mm, this content struggle. Not just parents and counselor, parents with teachers as well. It's always quite stressful in school. Yeah. Okay. Um. Next. Right. So just a little bit of um sample for you to see. So in oh by the way, right? There's something. I'm actually in the school right now. Can you hear some noise? Is it? Is there any background noise that you can hear? Uh. Yes. Is it a call for prayer? Uh. Not really. It's actually band. I think. Oh, <laughs> music, it's okay. Music room is upstairs. So let me know. If I can really... hear. I can hear something, but then uh, I think it should be fine. Cause unless it is disturbing to you. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's okay, but I'm afraid it's too loud for the audience. It should it's be okay. Still, still bearable. I'm so still bearable. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, a little bit of examples of the counseling tools that I use with the students. So just just for you to understand. Um. So in counseling setup, because they are students, they are secondary school students in. If there are primary school students, usually we have toys like Barbie doll or then a mini H's or then we buy um, some soft toys for them. Yeah. So usually we have some toys for them to play with. That's for primary school students. For secondary school students, usually they say, ah, I'm not a kid anymore, you know, I, I don't need toys. Yeah. Don't, don't give me toys. If you pass them some toys, they will like, Ugh. Very, very like not happy with it because they they feel like they're like I'm more adult right now. Yeah, I want to be more adult. Yeah, so cards are something that can still bearable. It's still bearable for them. They can still carry some cards, like the cards that you can see from the left. Um, is to help us to it's help them to express themselves using some cards, such as um their feelings. It's not very common for Asian kids to talk about feelings if. Of course, um, in the current generation, they are more exposed to feelings. So they will talk about, I feel, um, I feel sad or I feel uh, 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 guilty or things like that. They have a bit more words, but still limited. Yeah, for some kids, they still prefer using some cards or tools. 
and you see some mini etcher like little little mini etcher there right it's actually for um yeah thank you family sculpture uh this is what i learned from my family therapy this is to this is actually from my client one of my clients so this is how he arranged his family so it includes his family like um, his himself his parents his uh, grandparents and then his relatives those who are closer to him and the distance you see the distance as well and how he's how he order orderly or uh, sequence it right or place it is all depends on his um relationship with that person is it further or nearer so so yeah there are some concepts around it but it's very useful to to use it with with the teenagers as well when um for asian again asian families it's not easy for us to talk about family too especially we're so loyal to our parents we can't say bad things about parents actually a lot of time they will protect their parents they will say no no it's my parents are good yeah we are okay in fact we heard a lot of um kind of manipulative or controlling parents story but there are times they will just change and say no no i think my parents is right yeah so this is one of the tools that i use um there are some other values card um, i think in terms of identity this is the age where they talk about identities so we have this values card for them to identify what is more important in their life even though 14 years old they may not know why is this <laughs> but we try we explore a little bit yeah start from 13 and 14 years old family tree um, similar like the oh, the sculpture the mini nature things help us to understand the family relationships and sometimes i ask them to do timeline the blackboard here timeline um, of their graph their life graph how do they see their lives um, from three years old to 11 years old to 13 years old and what they have experienced so we get them to just draw um, and a little worksheet as well like um, things that they can control things that they cannot control so you can see um, when we're dealing with teenagers a lot of worksheets or a lot of tools can be used yeah it can be quite effective of course there are kids who say i don't need any of this i just want to talk miss kasin yes yes yeah they can just talk yeah for those who are very expressive or they just need a space to express then we allow them to just talk one hour or one and a half depending on the case yeah right next okay so um actually i i thought about how many cases i want to present today uh, to share with you um i thought through this i thought maybe a one one case but a very very rich case would help you to understand um, in a more comprehensive way. So I actually just choose one case to present today. Um, this is my client, um, female, 17 years old, year 11. Year 11 means um, our form five, which is the last year of their high school life. Yeah. Uh, she has an older brother and a younger brother. She's a middle child at home. So she claimed, she told me, uh, by to label herself she said i have ocd i have ob obsessive compulsive disorder and then i have some anxiety issue so she came and just talked to me like that so she has been to therapy before seeing me in school um, for around six to eight months but we have met since last year around 11 sessions in school already okay uh she said that she was bullied in when she was in preschool and primary school okay and then she has a very good self-awareness so this is a little background for you to get to know this this client of me um what i want all of you to just uh, pay attention to is first um, i'm going to give you the background um some of the statement that she make and then her um we're going to a little bit discussion about her feelings and what has made her who she is today and then um, a little bit of my perspective and my intervention with her all right uh, so what i want you to pay attention to is to to imagine yourself in her shoes yeah imagine you were her 17 years old female year 11 last year she's going to have her exam this year 
end of this year, the big exam in high school. And then she claimed that she has OCD and then she has anxiety issue. She attended session outside, but she stopped. And then she, now that she's in school, she continued therapy with me, was bullied back then. Okay. And she understands herself quite well. All right. Uh, next. Yes. Okay. Um, a little bit of presenting issue. These are all her statements. So to give you a feeling of how she felt and how she think about herself. Okay. So she said that um, I'm not allowed to feel sad at home because my parents asked me to be happy. Okay. I love my parents, but I think they will never take my word seriously. They did not take any action when I was bullied. And they only noticed about my problem, my mental health issue, after I started cutting myself at home to cope with my pain. They don't really understand me. Okay. Uh, next. I sometimes feel like I have four persons in me. The logical one, the harsh, the protector in me that always criticize myself, I'm a bad person. The me, the, the, the me in me, and the one who shuts me, shut the other three person. I just want to shut down. I just want to forget everything else. Shut everything down. The intrusive thoughts are so, so annoying. I have a tendency to follow restricted rules. Like I only wash my hand using the wash basin in even number. I cannot stop myself from doing this. I want to stop myself. I know this is wrong, but I cannot stop myself. So hard. I feel like there's something wrong with my body. I feel pain with my body, but I don't know why. But I see doctor, doctor say I'm fine. We cannot find any reason of the pain. Okay, next. I think I'm a bad person. I've done so much of mean things in the past and I think I deserve to be punished. I'm such a terrible person. I'm angry with myself. I always angry with myself. I feel guilty and shameful about myself. I'm angry with my parents too, who did not understand my situation when I was bullied. I thought they can do something for me, but they never. They never take me seriously. Okay, next. So the, the statement just now, um, of course I, I did so adapt, I mean adjust a, a little bit, but basically these are what she said to me in the session. Yeah, so it was very, emotion, um, a, very emotional. She was um, talking to, as though like she's talking to herself a lot of time when she was with me. Yeah. So she has a very eye, good eye contact. We can talk pretty fluent. She can talk very fluent English. Um, she can express him, him herself quite well, but um, she go in a general one, go around and round and round. She rarely goes straight to the point most of the time. So I need to ask her a lot, a lot of questions to get her talking in in the issues itself, yeah. She usually she will just go outside of the issues and keep talking in general, yeah. So this is what I heard from her. She bullied by a teacher when she was five years old, and then oh, that was when she was in kindergarten in the preschool. She said that the teacher was very biased. The teacher scolded her in front of her friends, but she didn't know what she did wrong. Um, the teacher just punished her like that. Okay. She talked to the parents, but the parents said it's okay. It's maybe you misunderstood or something. So she kind of being dismissed, her feelings being dismissed by the parents. When she was in seven years old, she bullied by her friends in school. She said that um, they don't want to be friends with her, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So she, she got bullied in school. Um, that was seven years old. And then in between, she told me that she did some mean things to her cousins. She said something um, she said not good, not good. She always label her, her good and bad most of the time. I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, this is right, this is wrong. Very clear, okay. Uh, 13 years old, she said she has made some toxic friendships. Uh, very controlling, very manipulative, she said. So the friends asked her to do certain things and because she wants to please her friends, eventually she did. Uh, she did something to please her friends. 
And then 14 years old. Oh yeah. So 13 years old after she noticed that like, it was really toxic. She said that I decided to cut off this relationship. So she cut the French the friend. Um cut off the friend and they never contacted after that. But 14 years old, she self-harmed. She started self-harm. She started cutting herself. Um and just want to give you an idea about self-harm a little bit. Uh, a lot of time we like we probably will say people like um self-harm, why the person wants to do that, right? Is it is it because um a lot of time we will hear people saying why they self-harm is because they want they because they feel like they need to get rid of the pain in their heart. They feel like they have heart pain. The heart pain is even more than the pain on their hands of their cuts. That's how they feel. Because that's how that helps them to survive as well. They cope with it. If if they don't do that, they feel like they they cannot survive. They cannot function. Yeah. Function as in they cannot go with their normal life, like eating, sleeping, hang out, social, go to school, these kind of things. They they feel like they cannot do that anymore. If they don't do self harm, yeah, that's why people um, and it's quite common in teenagers nowadays. I have quite a lot of self harm cases in school, and quite can be shocking and can be not shocking as well. Yeah, unfortunately, we have quite a lot of cases like this nowadays. It's quite common, and it probably probably because of the awareness from the social media as well. So they thought this is like one way of doing. So I would. Maybe I would choose self harm over other methods. Yeah, that can be as well. Another influence. Okay, next. Another information for you. Um, remember just how I saw I told you about the family tree. Huh? So this is what I normally do as well with my my student. Um, I check about their situation at home. I find out more about their family condition. So, um, their age of the client, um, the age of their parents what they do for life, uh, how's the environment at home. So uh, apparently, uh, she has an older brother who is a very big gap from her. Uh, yeah, so the older brother actually not staying with her. In fact, this older brother actually is a step older brother. They are not, I'm, I'm not too sure is it same father or same mother. Yeah, so they are not in a, they are not staying together. She has a younger brother. Um, and from what I heard, the maternal grandmother has been conflicted for many years with her own mother. Yeah, so they are, you see the red color zigzag line, right? They are very conflicted. Um, and that actually has quite a lot of impact in their family because the grand, the maternal grandmother also has an impact on her. Yeah, so that's how we can see the generation or impact from the grandparents to the fathers and mothers and then to the client to to the kid the child because a lot of time the stress or the tension can be brought down like this one layer second layer unfortunately some of the families they cannot stop probably three layers four layers five layers i don't know when they have, when they can stop but there are families who manage to stop maybe the second or third so it depends on how how this client, the 17-year-old client, aware about the issues in the family so that she can stop. Yeah, and which is that this is one of the um goal we want to do in the session as well. Okay, so far is there any question from any of you? Can can you understand or is it too hard to understand? Is everything okay? If you if you can still understand so far, can you just type? Uh, Yiming has raised hand. Yiming, you want to ask question? Yisin also raised hand. Do you want mm. to ask question? Okay. No doctor, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, no question? Well, okay. I have a question. Oh, yes. Yes. Shitong, right? Okay. Uh, yes. Mm. Um, oh. uh, because I now... Uh, I have been a teacher in a primary school and a middle school in China. The mm. most 
Uh, yes, the most family members, especially students, their parents doesn't care, don't care about their, uh, their, uh, kids or their children's uh, mental health mm. problems. So if you face with this kind of situation, that what can you or what can we do to help the students? Mm, mm, mm. So um, I repeat, just rephrase your question. Yeah. So you mean. Yes. Um, when we meet a student whose parents don't really care about mental health, they don't really care about emotional needs of yeah. their kids. And what can I do in this situation? Is it? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, looking at this case right now, right, is exactly okay. the case. It's the same thing that you, you shared with me just yeah. now. The parents are not concerned about, actually the father is a doctor. Um, uh, is a medical doctor. The mom, the mom is also in a profession. I can't remember. Is it, is it an accountant or something? Yeah, also in a profession. So they are all professional, educated person. The father is a medical doctor, but the according to the child, right? The parents are not really concerned, or they do not prioritize on their mental health on her mental health, her emotions, and that's why she felt like she couldn't really be sad at home. Because the mom will say, you can't be sad at home. You don't, don't need to be sad. Why do you want to be sad? That's, it's not, not a big deal. Right? Why do you want to be sad? So a lot of times she get dismissed. So in sessions, we meet a lot of clients like this. And what we cannot, we can't change how parents are unless the parents are being brought in for family therapy, which we usually try our best to convince the parents to come. Actually, I did try a few times, many times actually, to get the parents to come. Um, but the problem is there are some limitations in school and um, the readiness from parents to come for therapy is, is not easy to. It takes quite a while for them to feel like they're ready for our therapy. Yeah, so. Family therapy will definitely help them, help the parents to be more aware that they need to give emotional um, emotional comfort to their kid. Okay, that's one way. But if family therapy is impossible, you know, some of the parents, they just say, no, I'm, I'm okay, right? So what we can do with this kid, um, we have one theory here, uh, we call it differentiation, self-differentiation. So self-differentiation here means that how I can differentiate myself from my parents. I'm not my parents, okay? My parents uh, don't, don't, like, don't like to talk about feelings, but I'm not my parents. I can talk about my feelings. Why do I need to follow them, right? Yeah, I can choose. If they feel empowered that, oh yeah, I can do what I need. I can do what I want. I can choose my life. Then they are more separated from their parents. Then emotionally they can be more stable if they can achieve this but honestly speaking every one of us here how many of us here every one of us here we all um in the process of differentiation all of us are doing this and it's a lifelong journey it doesn't stop here it doesn't stop at my age it doesn't stop at 80 years so maybe they're still trying you know the differentiation never never stop it, it's just about the um how close you are towards differentiate yourself from your parents. Because we are Asian people. Asian people, we focus on what? We focus on family. So your parents will say, you don't, you don't follow my instruction, you obey us, uh, you, you disobey us. Is it, you disown us, is it? Yeah, they might think that way. So this, this concern, there's a constant struggle here with, within uh, fam, Asian families particularly. Yeah, I, do I answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yes? Okay, yeah, you, thank you. You give me yes. some ways that I can think of this question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah it's very yeah. difficult to solve, but we have to try our best to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and help, help the child to feel they are, they are capable to do so. A lot of time, these kind of kids, they are very helpless. Yeah. Mm, they feel like I can't do anything. I want to give up. 
I just want to give up. I don't want to talk to them anymore. But if we help them to not give up, to keep trying or to keep um, working on themselves, there, there will be chances that they, are, they will be okay. Yeah. Thank you for your very, very good question. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, any other question before I move on? No? Okay, then I'll move on. When I say move on, the music also on. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, okay, question for you. Yeah, I have shared quite a bit about this um this client of mine right so my question is how would you feel if you were the 17 year old girl how would you feel you can type in your chat box so that i can kind of um know how you empathize how do you empathize with this girl if you put yourself in her shoe it's quite difficult isn't it Mm. Lonely and helpless. Yeah. Suffer. Mm. Hopeless. Feel like giving up on everything. Mm. Lack of confidence. She means they're powerless. Yeah. She felt like she can't do anything, right? Very helpless, very powerless. Oh, feel sad. Hmm, Jangan said I will feel sad and I'm able to achieve self-help. I need reasonable help to find answers. Yeah, so, so true, right? Sometimes they don't even feel like they deserve to be helped. It's quite sad. They, they may sometimes say, I don't think I deserve to be helped. I'm a bad person. You, you don't need to help me. I have so, quite a few of them say this to me. Yeah. Confused, yes. I hope someone can understand my what I really feel inside. Trying to survive, feel lonely. Lost aims of future life. Yeah, she's not looking forward actually. She told me that she's not looking forward at the future life. Um, the people I love most have no way of understanding of my feelings. Yeah. And you know what? She's still constantly um, finding ways to talk to the parents and hopefully the parents can validate her feelings. But she still failed to do that. Mm, she still can't get it until today. Very disappointed in the world. Mm, not just the family, but with the world. That's how she felt as well. No? Anxiety, anxious, helpless, unconfident, confused, fear of unknown future. Every day is very anxious. I want to back more young. Everyone doesn't like me very sad every day. Sad emotions continue. Don't want to meet everyone. Disappointed. I don't think anyone understands what I think. Yeah. Stay alone in school until graduation and find a job and move to an ICT. Mm. I hate everything. Yeah, yeah. Right. So thank you. Thank you for being empathetic with her. To feel how she feel. Yeah. Um that, that's how I felt as well. When when I'm um, doing my counseling sessions, I empathize with her. So I felt how she felt, just like how you did. Yeah. So that's part of your part of my job, like what you are doing right now. Mm. Um another part of our job is also to to verbalize the feelings of her. So imagine she said, um, I can tell her something like, like I can feel how confused you are right now. Yeah, to name this, to, to label this also to help her feel comforted, to feel understood. Yeah, that would help. Okay, so you have done your very first step as a counsellor. Very, very well done, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> okay, next. Sorry, I have a lot of questions for you. The next one. What exactly happened in the past that may have led to her feelings? Now that you have empathized with her um, feelings, right? So what exactly that caused or led to this? What do you think? Based on what whatever I shared with you. Of course, it's not a full story, um, but 
I hope at least you catch some of the main highlights in her life. Yeah. Not Chu Chong say not good at some subjects. Can you el just elaborate a little bit more? When you say not good at some subjects. Okay, uh, maybe I want to clarify the question again. So I what I meant here is um from whatever that I have shared with you about her story in the past. Yeah, what have um what happened in the past actually led to her feelings like what causes her to have all this helpless powerless feelings be punished by parents and cannot understand her feelings her situations bullying by teachers and friends be ignored not encouraged and not supported yeah being unfair to her yeah she mentioned so many times that she felt unfair in her life bullied by friends and not supportive parents <laughs> Chu Chong said oh okay i see <laughs> thank you maybe parents are busy with work and do not have time to care about their children just care about their children's food yeah yeah we we, we care a lot about um shelter well, parents nowadays they care so much about shelter they get iphone they get very good uh bags all the adidas nike shoes but they can't give them the emotional support. Yeah, sadly. Uh, she cannot get the help from someone close to her. Okay. Yeah, she not feel, cannot feel warm. Yeah. The conflict between the family, um, her family members. No good friend to help her. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't talk about the friend as well. Yeah. Helplessness. She, she doesn't really have many friends. That's true. No support and understanding from parents. No good peer support yeah family of origin school violence okay no one supports her not good looking compared to other girls <laughs> yeah i mentioned this <laughs> do you do you go both based on the the illustration that i shared <laughs> no one supports her yeah so most of the most of things that are oh, traumatic environment so most of the things that you all have mentioned here are like the bullying okay um the family being not supportive or emotional support particularly um, not being able to listen to her um, no peer support right the peer support is so important right um, unable to express herself her difficulties with her parents feelings are not being respected yeah yeah thank you thank you so much all right uh, Dora, next one okay so a little bit from my lens and actually you all have the qualities of become a counselor <laughs> yeah so you got most of this here um this is how we look at it so we we look from um Usually what we do is that we understand her presenting issue, which is what she told me, okay? When I collect information from her. So I also understand from her historical uh, background. So I shared quite a few things with you about her historical background. Huh? Before she seen me, what happened in the past? So a few things here that I catch is like family. Um, remember the family tree that I showed you just now? So there's a tension and stress from the grandparent, from her, especially her mother's side, the grandparents to her mother, and the stress and tension from the mother actually passed down to her, right? So she can feel the stress, and she, according to her, she's always the middle person. When I say middle person, it means middle person between her grandmother and her mother. Imagine how stressful it is, right? Being a middle person. And she's the, and look at this here, I put a little note. She's a middle child. She is already born a middle child, always stuck in between. Yeah? 
between the older sibling and the younger sibling. And middle child, um, if you have time, you can look for middle child syndrome. I think a lot of you probably have heard about it as well. So middle child, usually they born with a bit more confusion, unfortunately. And the parents either look at the, the older sibling or the younger sibling. They rarely put that much of attention. They always get like a neglected feeling in between because they are the middle child. Yeah. So imagine she's already the middle child and then she gets stuck between her parents and she gets stuck between her mom and her grandparents. It's quite quite in a, quite stuck, quite sandwiched in her situation. Mm. And a lot of time when we have family, just as someone said family origin, family of origin, if there are tension, anxiety in the family, usually it will pass down to the next generation. You will, you will see their kids feeling anxious easily, getting nervous, getting that fidgety. You can see their hands on, keep fucking their hands. And then when they talk, they just cannot feel, they feel restless all the time. So this is something that may happen. Of course, I'm not saying guarantee, yeah, but some family, yes, this will just pass down and it will cause the tension in the next generation, which is the client here. Okay, so family is one area. Trauma, some people also mentioned traumatic environment. She got traumatized by the bullying experience in school last time. So trauma will cause the person to feel less, um, to feel powerless, like I have no power. I have no sense of control. I can't, I can't control my life, right? It's like all um, being controlled by others, by my surrounding, by my environment. So she has the feeling like I couldn't really control my life, even though I'm like, what, 17 year old right now. I feel like my life is a mess and my past are the worst. You know? So in her mind, she still can refresh and refresh things like that. So it's a traumatic experience for her because it keeps refreshing in her mind. And then um, she lost trust with people. She has a lot of anxiety in her. And here is the one very thing, one, one highlight is the guilt and shame. Uh, a lot of trauma, traumatized people actually feel guilty and shameful because she, she felt like she's at fault. It's her fault for not um, capable in protecting herself when she got bullied, that she didn't raise her voice or she didn't defend herself at that time. So she feels shame. She feels ashamed about herself as well. Okay, so trauma is also that led to who she is today. Another one, I think um, your lecturer will cover very well later. <laughs> right. Erickson stages. Um, this is what we are looking at as well, especially for um, Actually, not just teenagers. We, when I look at my adult clients um, in my other clinics, this is what we look at too. Um, we look at where are they at their age and then what are they supposed to achieve yeah, according to Ericsson stages. So in this case, right, she's stuck at her preschool time, which is the initiative versus skill level, where she felt like she's constantly feeling like she's not in control. Um, not or constantly feeling like she's a bad person, okay, um, and questioning herself like is it good or is it bad? Um, she's not sure about herself, so I suspect she also confused in her identity right now, because she never passed through that that the previous stage, which is the guilt and initiative, so she probably stuck still stuck there. Yeah, when we stuck there, it means the following stages in Erickson's um. The development stages, right? Maybe that means cannot cannot make it, cannot go through. So she may start still start there. Emotions, or uh, because the mom say you cannot be sad, you should be happy. Why why are you so sad? You you don't cry here. Don't cry. Cry. Don't show weakness to us. Don't be weak. Crying is a weakness. You are so weak. So don't cry. So the mom asks her not crying. So she learned to adapt that way and to please the parents for by suppressing herself so she suppressed a lot of her emotions her feelings so that's why it's like, like a bomb now okay um and this is how i see it the emotions suppress suppressing of her emotion is also a protection 
is a way to protect herself so that she can function her life, so that she can still go to school. She doesn't need to stay at home and withdraw from others for a year. Okay, she can still go to school. She can still hang out with people, but probably in a, compared to others, she has lesser advantage in this. Yeah. So the last one, attachment. Um, she feels she has this anxious, which is an insecure attachment with the with the parents. Yeah, with the caregiver. So that is probably the reason why she feels so um, anxious around people. She's very insecure with herself, especially with her peers, her friends. She constantly questioning herself, like, am I a good friend to them? Do I deserve to have friends, actually? Yeah. So these are some of the things that I look at. Um, I, there are, of course, other areas as well, but these are the few things that I want to catch here. Okay. Any question? before I move on. Because I guess you can you probably quite relate can be can relate to this a bit more. If no question, then I'll move on. Almost yeah almost the end. Oh no okay yes okay let's go. Alright so this is the last part uh, which is the intervention. Um in counseling there are a lot of different school of thoughts. So we have different, mod we call it uh, modality, where we, you, with different school of thoughts, we use different methods, okay? So, but generally, the first thing first um, is always this one, which is to create safety for the clients. Um, when I say create safety, means we want to make them feel safe in this current space. So usually they don't come here and straight away they feel safe. They, they may still feel unsafe of, about potential judgment from counsellor, probably, or they may still feel like people are not trustable, trustworthy. Mm. So it quite it usually we take quite a while to keep them safe and we need to always assure them that, hey, it's okay, you are safe here, you're no longer the five-year-old kid, yeah, no worries, you are at a safer place right now with me and then you can protect yourself now, you are different. Okay, we want to differentiate again. Yeah, then the next one. Um, I'm, I'm giving you some general one. Yeah, acknowledge and validate their feelings. So she has a lot, a lot of stuck emotions back then when she was younger, like primary school, um, in preschool with the parents. So uh, I, I use quite a bit of EF, EFT, which is the emotional focus therapy here, where uh, I kind of like process a lot of, of her stuck emotions. The emotions, the feelings that she cannot verbalize when she was five years old, when she was seven years old. So I give her the words to, to say. So I, I say something like, oh yeah, it's okay. Because she has a lot of resentment towards her parents. And I, so I say something like, you have all the rights to, to, to feel angry with your parents. Because yes, that was the time that you don't feel cared. That was the time that you don't, um, you don't get protected by your parents where they should do when where they should do this something like that so it helps them to feel understood which is what you have mentioned just now a lot of times she she don't she doesn't feel like being understood by people yeah so in the counseling setup we process all the stuck emotions and then we make her feel like her feelings are all and experiences are validated okay and then next one yeah, so um, this is a bit, because the term is quite hard to understand. Engage encounters here means um, we kind, I kind of um, brought her back to probably like the five-year-old and give the five-year-old some voices. So a lot of time um, in sessions, we can do something like we um, get the client to imagine herself of course, it's when it's ready, yeah? not every every time, but when she is ready to do that, um, to imagine herself being the five-year-old um, now that she has grown up, but when she go back to the five-year-old, whether she, what would you like to talk to your mom? Yeah, what exactly does she want to tell her mom about how she felt? All right, so I put it as the escalation here. Okay, so for her to um, express herself and her feelings 
So she actually imagined her mom in the session. So I actually gave her a chair. So I have an empty chair in my room. I put an empty chair there. I said, imagine, I, I put a, I think a Pikachu or something, a ship, a toy ship there. I said, imagine this is your mom. <laughs> okay. Right. This is your mom. And she's here in front of you. And for you to talk to her. Okay. So then we start. Yeah. And so sometimes we do this as well. Okay. And then the, I think that's all for my case example. I think the next one. Oh yeah, okay. Um, I like this quote so much. Uh, it's from the a very well-known um, therapist called Irvin Yalom. So he said that effective therapy should never try to force discussion of any content area, but therapy should be theory not should not be theory driven, but relationship driven. I think it's the same for teacher um, relationship with students as well. Uh, like. Even though how skillful I am, how technical I am, how good is my skills, right? The the what what is the most effective thing is actually the relationship. How good is the relationship between myself and that girl? If we are actually having a very, very close relationship, she has trusted me. She we can co-regulate with ourselves, she can feel the safe with me, she can feel the trust, the warmth the care from me, this is something work for her already. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter what method it is. Is it so so good method or is such a bad method? Whichever it is, it's about the relationships that, that I believe. Yeah. Okay, and I think that's, that's all for the case. So, and this is the last one. Uh, but before, before I go to this, um, my joy, my work joy and challenges. Is there any questions about this case? Or you want to leave the question in the Q&A? Fine. I have a question. Oh, yes. Okay. Please. How many times that do you have to talk to the student before she opens up to you? Because you mentioned relationship, right? Mm. How long does it take for, for her? To... For this particular student? For this particular student. Uh, oh, the first time I saw her, right, she was so skeptical about me. She threw me so many testing questions. She tested water, right? She tested my reaction. She looked at my reaction. She see how I re responded to her. The first, I think the first few was, yeah, she was still testing until fourth, I think, fourth session onwards or fifth, she was getting more comfortable with me. And then, you know what? She praised me too. Oh, what, <laughs> yeah. what did she say? So, so I was quite shocked because uh, I, I, think, I think we did something and then we processed a lot of emotions, her past and refrain. Then she said, oh, you're really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you, you you can sense the, the changes of mm -hmm. the relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From from the mistrust stage. And then later she tests water, and then she throw you a lot of things to test your responses. Then we process together. She has some mm -hmm. safety, she has some space. Then you know you notice that eh, her reaction to use has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She gets more calm. Um when she talks to me, she gets more calm. And then there are times that once in a while she will come and look for me. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you can see how much um her I think it's the, the trust has been established. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why she she felt like um this is a space for her to talk. And whenever mm -hmm. she feels like she's not in a good um good mood or good um condition, mm -hmm. she will she will not hesitate to come and look for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's the most important thing because she knows there's an outlet here. Mm. Mm. Any other question, guys? Yeah. Any questions about the case? Hello, I have a question, Cassine. Yeah. Yes. It's led to meet you. 
uh, I'm also a teacher from China. Um, oh. I want to know if a student forced to meet you and uh, she didn't trust you and uh, didn't want to say anything and uh, didn't mm. want to open your heart for you. Mm. Uh, how can we uh, let them trust uh, me? Yeah. Mm, trust mm, you mm, trust yeah. Me. yeah. Yeah. I can imagine how struggle it is, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not talking and then yeah, not responding. Um, yeah, refuse fact, to communicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually have client like that. I have a student. I have a few student like that. Um, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. So what um I did with that a few of them right. One of them, he was not having eye contact with me. This is how he react. He's like this for. More than 20 minutes. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Maybe more than 30 minutes. He just like this, not talking. And then look down. Do this. <laughs> okay. This is what he does. Uh, no matter how, how many questions I ask him. Then he started to talk to me. You remember the mini Asia, um, the family mini Asia thing? The little mini Asia? I was thinking maybe I use some tools to talk to him. Yeah, he doesn't want to talk. It's okay. I told him it's okay if you don't want to talk. Well, maybe you are not ready. Um, but it's okay. So, um, how about this? Maybe I, I give him something. So I say, maybe you can share a little bit with me about yourself, you and your friends. So, so I say, now nah, this is you. Who are your friends? So he put his friends, like around him, something like that, and. I asked one question, then he replied one or two words, <laughs> but at least he answered. Yeah, so I was quite grateful that he actually answered. Then it took place like maybe 40 or 45 minutes like that. Then we ended the session. The next time I met him, um, still the same. He took a while to warm up, but I, I was surprised that he actually opened up. He, he did talk after that a little bit. And now, I said, have seen him, I think at least six or seven times. He can talk to me fluently <laughs> and have to stop him to talk. Yeah. So, so I think it's the, the rapport in the beginning so important. So the first time, the second time, how you react to the students, are you trying to judge him or are you trying to be um, friend with him? I think he can feel it. So probably it's not it's not uh it's not threatening uh this is the word. For him maybe oh this teacher or this counselor is not threatening, <laughs> it's safe. Then he feel like okay, maybe I can try talking to her. Yeah. So use some tools. Just now I have shared a little bit of tools, right? The drawing or whichever he likes, it can be drawing or comic or soft toys or mini nature cards. Cards are quite useful. I think for teachers, we have cards and it's quite useful to, to help them to express. Yeah, so hopefully those are helpful for, for the kids. Mm. Do I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. I also try art therapy before, yeah. Mm, when I meet oh. children, you didn't want to talk. Maybe you want to join because mm. I'm an art teacher. Yeah. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. I think Especially, art therapy is a good way. Yes, yes. Especially traumatized kids. Like I worked in shelter before. They they love drawing. Yeah, they love colors. So give them some colors, and then they can start expressing themselves. Yeah, it's a good way. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I saw some questions already. Uh, oh, Zhang, Zhang, Zhang Gan, Zhang Gan, you sent to me prior. Oh, okay. I think you sent to I me I saw prior. another question as well just now. Yeah, okay. Is it? Uh, um, wait, um, there's one question. Uh, mm. Ya Bing, uh, mm. are you there? Chatis is uh, has raised in. Uh, do, are, do you have a question? Uh, young young poor first. Are you here? Can you ask your question directly? Mm 
Okay, the question, let me ask uh, on behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, many times as teachers, we help many students deal with psychological problems. Mm -hmm. uh, however, as time goes by, we also have some psychological problems. How mm -hmm. can we how can we deal with So, cursing, how do you decompress, uh, disattach yourself because you are absorbing other people's issues? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, is this what you're trying to ask, uh, young Po? Mm. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah, it's unavoidable, right? When we deal with a lot of students' issue, we put a lot of students' issues on our shoulder. Yeah, I think I I was just talking to some of the teachers in my my school um about it about boundary. I'm not sure. I think in in education course there there is like a module about i'm not sure is that like a module about boundary between teacher and students yeah so i i suppose that 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 line has to be even clearer because sometimes it's it's blurred means that means that we we over taking a lot of responsibility um or even emotions from the student unaware unaware so means a lot of time you don't really you don't even notice that you actually have um taken their emotions on your shoulder yeah so one thing that would help is actually to be more clear with your boundary just like me i i used to i used to take every case like so so serious until i couldn't sleep at night until i go back home eating i still thinking about it and then until I talk to um, my partner, I talk to my friends and of course not the case, but I talk about how stressful it is and things like that because I cannot draw the line clearly. And I notice that and I stop myself, I kind of make it clear. After what time I shouldn't pick up calls? After what time I shouldn't text my students? I know they come sometimes text in the um, midnight, but I don't reply. I take time to reply then. I don't reply straight away. So I think this will help to prevent um, this psychological problem to happen. Okay. Well, if it's a bit too late, <laughs> we forgot to draw our line. It has happened. What to do? Okay. Uh, we, of course, I do, I do look for my own counselor as well. So counselor do look for counselor. <laughs> it's normal. Psychologists also look for psychologists. It's normal. <laughs> Uh, so if you find yourself, um, usually this is our term. We always say unable to function, but in gen in simpler way is when you feel like you can't sleep, you can't eat, your eat habits have changed, your sleep pattern has changed, your body shape has changed. Your, your, your colleagues say you are quite abnormal lately, huh? What happened to you? Why you don't talk or why you talk too much? So these are all the changes. Um, uh, you cannot concentrate well, very forgetful and things like that. If you feel like this is quite stressful for you, then just seek help. When I say seek help, means you look for a counselor, you look for a therapist. Yeah, but if you feel like it's still manageable, it's not to that extent. I'm still functioning okay, but just a bit stressed or burnout. Then maybe you can try. Um, yeah, I know it's very good. Uh, it's very general, like what exercise, watch Netflix, or <laughs> binge uh, some shows, or get distracted a little bit. And of course, I of course I, as a counselor, I will always talk about self care. Self care means you take care of yourself. You um, take care of yourself. You you do things that you like, um, things that you enjoy, and and. A lot of time, I also include self-care. The self-care element, one of the big part of self-care element is actually forgiveness. You forgive yourself. That's also self-care. You forgive that you can't do much for your kids, for those students sometimes. Yeah. So that is also self-care. Oh, that will help a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Thank so you. that question is coming from Yang Po. Uh, hmm. Shatish, your hand is raised. Uh, your question? Uh, yes, Doctor. Um, okay, my question is, um, 
okay, uh, what is the most challenging situation uh, for a counsellor, mm. especially when giving counselling to a reluctant patient? Mm. No? Mm. And uh, is it can be stressful about being a counsellor? That's my question. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. A straightforward answer is yes. <laughs> it is stressful. Uh, especially in school. Okay. School setting is very different. School, uh, we have willing clients. They come in, they say, Miss Kasi, I want to see you. Okay. 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 That's willing. Huh? We have unwilling cases like, sorry, teacher asked me to come here. I don't know why I need to come here, but teacher asked me to come here. Yeah, these are unwilling cases. So if they refuse to see you, uh, again, it's about rapport, rapport building, how we can build the rapport with the kid and be very neutral about it. Because a lot of time they thought, my, I have done something wrong with it. That's why my teacher asked me to see counsellor. But in fact, a lot of time, the, the main purpose is to support the students. The counsellor's job is to support the students to find out what happened and how we can support them better instead of judging them. Hey, you are here, you did a wrong thing and then you come for counselling. So, uh, yeah. So it's to build the rapport and to be neutral when you talk to them. Mm, I think that, that would be helpful for them to build trust. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, uh, Shatish is uh, clapping, so I assume yes. Uh, so uh, yeah. the next set of questions, uh, Kasin, uh, we mm. haven't even gone through Q&A and there's a lot of good questions here. Uh, the next set of questions is actually from Jingwen and Yu mm. Uh Both are related to parents. So Jingwen's mm. question is, uh, how do you make it easy for the parent to accept that uh, the student needs help? Mm. And then uh, you this question is, if I can summarize, uh, mm. it's probably something, it's an issue that uh, UJ uh, faced in, in work before. So um, parents mm. uh, de uh, in denial, meaning mm. uh, in insisting that the, the student uh, is, uh, is the student's issue. It's not mm. the parent's uh, mm, mm, mm. problem. Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, Yu Chie, hopefully I summarized your question correctly. Uh, yeah, do you have any suggestion? So number one is uh, parents in denial. Uh, mm. Number two, how do you um, get the parents to work with you in terms of accepting your, your recommendation? Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so I'll go with uh, Jing Wen's question first. Yeah. Um, when you said the students has a mental health problem and must see a psychologist, I assume you were saying when you said mental health issues, it must be like is it is it something like depression, anxiety, uh, that kind of issue? Is it is it? Do you mind to just clarify a bit? Uh, Jingwen, can you uh, explain you um... or or you refer to like ADHD or um, you know the kids with some neurodevelopmental issue? Which one are you uh, like uh, ADHD? Okay, so it's... okay. It's more towards uh, um, neurodevelopmental issue like learning disability, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what can be done to make it easier for parents to accept? Hmm. Oh, this is really hard. Um, we usually, we don't really convince them, but we will try, again, it's the neutrality, like how neutral you can put it, because some of the words um, can be quite hurtful for them. For example, you said they are abnormal your kid is an abnormal in school. So that's really hurting, right? Um, or you say something like, uh, your, your, stu your, your child is misbehaved or your child, um, yeah, these are all the labeling. We, we try to avoid all this labeling 
just don't talk about all this labeling. Just say that um, we are really concerned. Show our concern to the parent. Um, we really like the like your child, and we we really see potential in him or her, um, in doing this so well. Uh, the, the subject so well. So we hope that we can, um, with our concern and care, we notice these observations in class. So put it more factual and also give your observations as well so that they can't really deny it. <laughs> observation means observation, right? You can't deny the observation. So um, class observation, teacher's observation, um, counselor's observation, these are all helpful for them to see it. But whether they want to accept it or not is really not up to us, honestly. Yeah, because it takes time for them to um, to accept, to see it and accept. So what we can do is that we, we call them the first time. They say, no, 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 my kid is not like that. Okay, they hang up. Okay. Then another month, okay, you collected another data, another set of data. You try again, you call again, right? And then you explain again. No, 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 okay, never mind. <laughs> the third time. So it takes quite a while for them to like, okay, see the issue. If if after so many times of reporting and the parents still remain denier, honestly speaking, unfortunately, there's nothing much that we can do. Mm. Because we have done our part here. Mm. We do have students and um, parents like this. So it's quite a bit helpless in that situation, but we really can't do much. Yeah. Okay, for Yijie's question, right? Um, so in short, the question is, how can I help the students So I um for EJ right when you mention the, the the student has no problem in very active in school social indicators normal um, but appear restless and there's some problem with communication so what uh, but parents denied this parents say parents not denying but parents say it's students problem can you come and explain your question because um, <laughs> we we have some gaps there to understand what you're trying yeah. to ask yeah yeah oh he said in fact i think this is her parents for all oh, he said that he uj means in your point of view is actually parents problem Mm, okay. Oh, the, okay. So you said that the student is simply having trouble communicating, communicating with the parents. So is, so are you saying it's actually the family issues? Yeah. So he has some, this student actually have some family issues and problem communicating with the parent at home. So what can I do for the for the student? Is it can can you just come and explain a bit? Jay, where are you? Or maybe we can go through other questions. The other question, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zhang Fan say we do have psychological tests, yeah, in China University to find out some special students. Yeah, yeah. What should we do when we are talking to them? Because some students think they. Uh, okay. So you your question, Zhang Fan's question is um, how do we talk to um, students? Potentially with some um, some neurodevelopmental issues, is it? Like how how do we communicate with them mm. so that they don't feel offended or they feel like I'm special? Okay. 
uh, yeah, when we're talking to them, um, usually they felt like they are being treated differently is because people judging them, like they feel judged. So it, I think again, back to the neutrality, how do we talk to this um, special needs, students with special needs, right? Is to, is to respect them and accept who they are because sometimes they may behave or they talk a little bit differently. So if we are able to detect that and not judging their behaviors or their, their words, I think that, that would already help them a lot in helping them with their self-esteem. Because a lot of time they feel like the self esteem may be quite low. Yeah. I hope I answered your question because I'm not too sure. The question is. Okay. You may mention some ask something as well. In my previous work, my school was a boarding school, and there was a girl who had a serious mental disorder suicidal behavior and she had to suspend school for treatment. Mm. After about half a year, she came back to school but no one was willing to live with her. Mm. Means, means no one, no friends want to be with her, is it? Stay with her. And the psychologist told us that it would worsen her, her condition. But there are still no students willing to, oh, so she's, oh yeah, because it's boarding school. So no one wants to live with her. I still don't know how to do the right thing because we can't force others. Hmm, yeah, this is quite hard. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if she has friends. If she has some friends, just a few actually would help a lot already. Yeah, but I can understand why others are scared, right? To to live with her because she has some suicidal behavior, so they're probably afraid about it as well. But I think okay, one one good point here is you mentioned about the treatment. She was suspended from school and then she went for a treatment for half a year. Okay. I think that if um if the therapist or the psychologist can actually come up with some testimonial or some progress report to show that oh, after the half a year treatment, how has she progressed up to that time? Then probably it would help the school. It would, um, yeah, it would help the school to to make the arrangement about the body because I think with that testimonial, people would be more convincing. Yeah. Uh, Christine? Yes. Um, I've seen there's more questions that are coming into the chat function. These right. questions are a lot of case referrals. So uh, I think you haven't finished your presentation yet. Oh, oh actually, yeah. it's, it's okay. Actually, it's the last already. one, yeah, oh. it's okay. It's a draw okay. and a challenge. Yeah, it's okay. No worries. It's a, okay. it's a, that's the last slide, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. notice uh, you might want to ask, uh, no, you might want to finish off your session just now. Okay. In that case, is it possible? Okay. There's a lot of questions coming in. Uh, mm. uh, um, some of them are quite difficult as well because it's case referrals. Mm. So, um, if uh, probably we can give Kasin, uh, Kasin, you can glance through uh, the, yeah. quest the rest of the question yeah. and then uh, sum it up. A general statement because okay. uh, yeah, it, we have taken a lot of Kasin's time actually. No, no worries. <laughs> the session is one hour, guys. Originally one hour, but it, it, it okay, turned okay. into almost two hours session. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, Kasin, go ahead and have yeah, a look at the yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, but okay. uh, guys, while Kasin is looking at the question, thank you so much for your participation. Uh, very active, very good questions asked, um, it shows that you are really thinking about what Kasin has shared just now uh, and uh, trying to relate it to what you are, the situations that you are familiar with. Okay. Uh, 
Kasin, uh, over to you. Mm. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think a few questions about communication. Students having communication with their parents. And then, um, yeah, like how should we guide students to reconcile with their parents because they have family issues? Um, again, it's a boundary. I, I don't know how much uh, a teacher or even even counsellor, if I'm counsellor, then probably I can suggest a family therapy like I suggested just now. But if, like I said, if the parents um, refuse to make some changes or make some progress, then there's nothing much that we can do. But yes, how, we, how do we guide the students to reconcile with their parents? Um, oh, okay, here's a here's the thing. We, we encourage them to talk to the parents, but we don't really know how the parents receive this. So there are some parents who may be a bit more, let's say, uh, I'm just put an example. Let's say the parents are more controlling or are more aggressive parents. So they may respond with a very harsh way. Um, so I, I'm, so I'm not too sure if we ask the students to be more open and to reconcile with their parents, is it really a good thing? I'm not too sure. Is it is it a um a ready step? Is are, are they ready to talk to the parents? Yeah, that's the that's another question we need to check whether the first whether the parents ready for communication. That's one. Whether the student at that time ready uh, to talk to their parents like to express themselves that's another question so i think it really depends on situation um, and again it's a boundary whether is it something that we need to do or even a teacher need to do because it's actually family issues mm. yeah uh, another thing i think another question also about communication like when students having some communication problem right uh, what we can do is actually there are some workshops outside. Uh, there are some NGOs or even some private centers that actually organize workshops, peer support groups. They actually have all these therapy and groups to help students to improve their communication skills. Yeah, so I think we can actually suggest them to attend this kind of workshops. It will help them to improve their relationship with others by learning how to talk properly with others. Um, how about the last one? Is is it, is it a question? Jin the last one is not a question, right? It's a statement. Right? Yeah, it's a comment. It's a comment. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But generally, from all your question, right, I can sense all these students here are very concerned students. A very concerned teacher. Yeah, you really cared about the students' well-being and, and you really want to know how you can help the students. Yeah, I think generally this is a trait in teachers, isn't it? Yeah, constantly want to help and see what you can do. But remember, I think one student asked about the, what is that? How about us when teachers have some psychological problem, what to do? So do remind yourself, you can't do everything. You are not Superman, Superwoman. Mm. So do take care of yourself as well while you are helping your student. Yeah, I think that's all for now. I don't see any other questions, right? Yeah, uh, I don't see any other question as well. So uh, thank you so much, Kasim. Uh, class, please give a virtual reaction, uh, a virtual <laughs> clap to Kasim. Okay. Uh, there's there's reaction button at the bottom uh, for you to use. Uh, thank you so much for... Uh, thank you spending your time with us, um, sharing a lot. Uh, I agree with you, just one issue alone, it takes that much time for us to process and un essentially unpack. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. So uh, class, uh, come, let, let us go back to the slide that uh, I shared with everyone. Uh, just now, Kersi mentioned Ericsson. The name Ericsson was uh, highlighted. So it is inside the slide, actually, on slide 15. Uh, is this the same Ericsson that we're talking about, uh, Kasin? Eight stages of development where uh, yes. yeah, the, yes. the case that you're studying is actually still in this stage. This yes. stage here refers to preschool stage. Yes. So she is currently in, at, I should say, young adulthood or adolescent. 
adolescent. Oh, yes, she adolescent. is currently yeah seventeen. Yes. Yeah. So, but she is still stuck at uh two stages be, be behind. Mm, so mm. imagine the the amount of work that Kirsten has to do in order to help this particular student to to get past uh, mm -hmm. her um, her concerns, uh, especially on 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 the parents on her own uh, self uh, confidence, um, how she perceives herself uh, against her friends, family members, and so on. So good to know, uh, Kirsten, you highlighted this particular theory. Uh, there's other sets of theories as well. Uh, so I uh, I would like you guys to go and have a look at the slide. The link is in uh, e-learning. Um, recording will be given at e-learning as well. Uh, after WebEx has generated um, this particular component, uh, the recording. Uh, but before I close the session, um, just want to ask Kersin a few uh, questions really. Um, Number one, uh, have you worked with other teachers? Because, okay, if you notice the questions that I asked leading on to 6 p.m. are all management related questions because sure. the topic will be uh, our course, guys, is managing student development. As much as you want to uh, think about the students case by case, you are now thinking along the lines of managers, school mm -hmm. principals, school administrators, vice principals and so on so put yourself in that head um Kirsten, can you share with us how do you work with other teachers uh in instances for example student shows uh self-harm uh did the teacher give hints to you so that you uh, you can go and observe a, a student for example how does mm. it work mm, mm, okay uh okay i first of all i need to just just uh, like a disclaimer Every school they work differently. Like school counselor in every school, they have different policies. So you will see quite a different management or uh, crisis management in general. So for our school, it's not the counseling department is not as established. Even though they do have counselor, but it's not the rules, the policies are not so good. Yeah, not so comprehensive yet. So for now, if let's say we have suicidal cases or self harm cases, um, what they will do is that actually they will just come straight to me. They will refer the students straight to me. They will tell me the observations they have in the class. And there are times I need to interview other students in the class. So I do, um, for now, I don't really sit in and observe. But when required, yes, I, I do sit in and observe the students when required, but not all the time. So I can re either sit in or I can actually talk to their classmates um, of that suicidal uh, case their classmates and then um, to understand the the condition and the the condition yeah the condition of the, the 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 student in the class so they the teachers come to me straight and then i will once i have met the students uh, in in person in session then i will update the teacher again so i will meet the teacher again to update and then we think about what is the moving forward. So usually they will ask, oh, what should I do? Uh? What, what can I do in, for this case? Then we will figure what would be the most appropriate uh, way. So some of the cases I need to report directly to the principal. So for example, last year I have a family abuse case, very serious. Uh? So I did uh, even, I, I even, uh, I talked to the principal, I reported to principal. And then principal reported to the CEO of the school, which is the, the principal's boss. And then um, we decided, we talked to the student personally, all of us. And we also decided to inform the Kabajikan, which is the welfare department, Malaysia welfare department. So we called them, we reported as well. And then, uh, yeah, so, so there are quite a few things um, that that the procedure that we have to do in school as a student as, as a school counselor um if it's like suicidal case usually stop at principal and parents right? so usually we report it to principal then we will decide okay is it a case to be reported to the parents if it's like a must then we will have a meeting with parents they have to come to school yeah so it depends on severity of the cases. Usually, the bridge case, like the bridge confidentiality cases, are suicidal, 
okay, when they say, oh, I, I feel like I want to kill myself, I want to jump from the building, um, they cut themselves, they harm themselves. Um, mm, and this one more is something like uh, they, okay, it's, it's not bullying case, but it's, it's uh, they use social media to spread something about school, something bad about school. Yeah, that, That's something that we take it very seriously as well. We'll, we'll directly report to principal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so guys, uh, again, thinking about you, your role as a manager, as a school principal, uh, as administrator, uh, think about uh, the procedure that you have. How do you manage? Uh, what, uh, what is your responsibility? Because every chain of decision making um, uh, individual in your school will have uh, some some responsibility that he or she has to handle. So um, before escalating cases, probably we might want to have a look at what is the uh, sense operating procedure like, and then uh, what is your role, uh, where to report, what kind of intervention, the word that Kasim used just now, the kind of intervention that you can do to help. Uh, final, final, final question before we mm. close, Kasim. Um, mm. Now, uh, it's, as you mentioned just now, every school has uh, its own way of looking at things. Your mm. school, for example, look at uh, counselling as uh, as a complete package, meaning career counselling and then mm. put together. Uh, mm. In an ideal world, uh, what is it that you would like to see? Wow. In an ideal world here, guys, <laughs> refer to uh, if you have all the resources that you can have, if you have mm. everything that you can do, any decision mm. that you can help the counsellors, what mm. would you like to see? Mm, mm, mm. Perfect question for me. <laughs> <laughs> like giving me a magic wand, I can do anything I want. Yep, uh, correct. So first, I don't want to do career counselling. <laughs> so I can separate that, okay? So mm. I don't, um, I, I, I mean, ideally, the career and the mental health counsellor should be separated. Because it's a totally different field, actually. Mm. Yeah. So career guidance, we can have it for, do it for the career career guidance team. They have form a, they can form a team, so they can run the talks, workshops, and give advices to students about universities' res, um, availability, occupations, their job, their interests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the tests as well. Okay. And then for mental health well, counselor, then we can just fully focus on this. So we can do what we can do is like the policy. So we can have more time to run through the school policy, revise the policy SOP, and then um, of course we can handle more counseling sessions. Then we can run more um, you know talks that relevant to the mental health issues, bullying or um, self esteem, time management. Um, yeah, actually even time management they they consider as part of it. Uh, Let me think what else. Some of the schools, they actually have school counselor teaching. I'm lucky I don't need to. Uh, about um, to ask, forgot to ask uh, this question, whether you're teaching or not, because no, your I'm role not. alone is quite heavy. Mm, um, yeah, I refuse to teach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I refuse <laughs> directly. Yeah, mm. um, because the counselor before me, actually, she, she does. She did. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how burdened the work is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and okay, one, one more thing is the school events. I do find the pro and cons in school events. Um, I do like joining the school events because I think I can get close to my students in general. They, they see me, they know me, and then we can talk. It's a good catch up. But uh, it would take a load, a workload for me as well. Yeah, it's another workload. So it's a balance between how much I take, um, I mean, how much I can mingle around with the students and how much I need to do. I mean, work I need to do. So school events pending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that's that. Uh, now, guys, if you are a manager, school principal, these are the way you have seen two perspective. Uh, as from the school counselor, uh, herself, Kasi, uh, looking at the various cases, uh, uh what she does, uh, every day. Uh, and um, 
the other part of it is if you are a manager, how would you manage this uh, problem? Uh, not, not to say problems, but then the different roles and responsibilities that you have to handle. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, a, a school counselor's load, uh, especially. So uh, it's 6 p.m. on my time. Uh, I think, Kasin, you, you have to go back already. <laughs> you have been in school <laughs> for the whole day. So, uh, yeah. guys, give Kirsten another round of love. Uh, thank you so much, Kirsten, uh, for coming to my class. Um, I learned a lot today. Um, and uh, I think this is an effective way for... I, I think everyone here agrees that this is a really effective way of looking at the theories uh, immediately coming from uh, what you do every day. So, uh, yes, there's a lot of love coming out. Uh, thank so you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, last words, Kasi, before I close the class. Well, I want to add one more info. Um, one counsellor, the ratio for one mm. for the school, right? The number of students, um, current last year was one to one thousand two hundred. I um, one one counsellor to one thousand two hundred students. Okay, that is very bad ratio. Yeah. What is so, the ideal ratio? Okay, idea ratio according to the um, US uh, APA Association is actually 1 to 250. Okay, but well, in Malaysia, it's quite hard to achieve this. So even if we can achieve like 1 to 500, is already good enough, actually. Yeah, yeah. So 1 to 500 is okay. But of course, 1 to 250 is even better. Ideal, yeah. yeah, yeah, idea. Okay, thank you for inviting me, Dora, for for this sharing. Even I myself feel like I learned a lot too. <laughs> yeah, from the sharing itself. Okay, thank okay. you. Oh yeah, thank if, you guys. Um, do you think they yeah. they need my email? If do you should I share my email or something? If uh, any of yes, them... you can share your email with them. Um, the other thing is I will share. Um, if you don't mind, I would I can share your email with them. Uh, mm. oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I will be given uh, the chat log as well. So I just edit, uh, put in uh, your email, Kasin, and then they will have a copy of uh yeah, of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank mm. you, guys. Uh, I'm closing the session. Uh, Kasin, <laughs> have you. a safe trip home. Thank uh, you. Rest well. For the rest of you, I will see you again next week. We will tackle another set of uh, case study, uh, this time around coming from Isa. Uh, she will talk a little bit about her experience on early childhood development, specifically how she has worked in uh, kindergarten, the experience, the observation that she 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 has. So bye, guys. Bye, Kasin. Thank you so much for coming. Bye. Bye, Dr. Bye, Kasin. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And then bye.